tell us a little bit about Korzybski. Where was he born? When? Uh, well, he was born in Warsaw on, uh, I believe, July 3rd, 1979. Not to put louder. 1879. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. 1879. And uh, to uh, into a family uh, with very old records, go back to the 11th century Polish aristocrats. Now he was uh, the Kozybski family was connected with the Skarbek. I think we should should call it a clan, which was not the at the magnatial level of the magnates, the, the very great uh, aristocrats who owned land that was larger than most European countries. But they were close to it. They were certainly far above the lower schlachta, middle to lower schlachta nobility. Can you explain what schlachta means? Uh, Can you explain yeah, what schlachta is? Schlachta is the Polish term which is actually, interestingly enough, of German origin, uh, which refers to the nobility, in, which in Poland was very numerous. In no part of the country was it less than 10% of the population. Overall, it was probably more like 14%. In Chopin's day, in the early 19th century, the Schlachta in Mazovsha, which is the uh, province or vo voivodstvo in which Warsaw is located and where Chopin lived, the number of the nobility in, in that province was as high as 37 percent. And it's one of the reasons why Polish culture has such a shall we say, interesting character. Because these people, uh, the Schlachta, were much committed to intellectual brilliance and achievement and uh, flair uh, and so forth. They were the people who supplied the Husaya, the Polish winged horsemen, the Polish cavalry. They were actually predominant among the Polish flyers who flew with the RAF in World War II in the Battle of Britain and later. Uh, so that uh, Schlachta influence has had a very large impact on Polish culture at large. Even peasants have adopted and adapted Schlachta notions to their own lives. That's why you see so much kissing of hands all over Poland, wherever you go, today. So that's what the Schlachta is. Well, the Krzyzewskis were uh, at the upper level, but they were not Magnus, although they did have uh, connections with some of the Magnesial families, like the Tarwos, uh, maybe it should be Tarwi in, in Polish for the plural. Uh, so they, they, they were quite uh, important. The important thing for Krzyzewski's life and for what he accomplished was that a very large number of his ancestors were not just aristocrats, but they were working aristocrats. They were scholars, uh, soldiers, ecclesiastics lawyers, engineers. His father was an engineer, for example, who worked in the uh, Russian uh, communications uh, uh, ministry and traveled all over the Russian Empire doing his stuff. And there's an interesting point there because, you know, after the partitions of Poland and, and especially related to the 
insurrections of 1832-1863, many Poles, mostly nobility, were shipped into eastern Russia and further into Siberia, where, and very often they had to walk there, sometimes in chains. But when they got there and settled down, they proceeded to do research in the botany of the region around Lake Baikal is done by a fellow, I, I, I think his name Dubovsky. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of these Polish exiles did the basic geological, botanical, all kinds of research that let the Russians know what the hell they had in Siberia. <laughs> I find that very amusing and also very pleasing. So, that's that's who the, the Krzyzewskis were. And uh, he was born in Warsaw. His family was well off. Uh, his mother was where the title of Count came from. He was called Count Krzyzewski you know, in America. And uh, he himself was not very much <coughs> impressed with that notion of being a count. He, he thought it was rather a, an intrusion, you know, and being able to move around in a realistic way in the world. But his mother was very much uh, concerned with that kind of uh, rank. And uh, so he was uh, educated in Warsaw, uh, but also after he graduated from the Warsaw Polytechnic as a chemical engineer, he toured Western Europe. He went, he studied, he attended lectures. He was kind of an itinerant scholar uh, in Germany and France and, and Italy. And he had a very interesting career, career, as Ignacy Friedman says, in, in Italy. Uh, I, I guess the the most famous thing about that is that for the, he was known as a, a kind of a roustabout. He was a, a young nobleman on the loose. He had learned fencing with sabers primarily in Poland. Uh, he was a very uh, adventurous, fun-loving character. And so much so, and, it, and he had lots of affairs with uh, Italian women, so much so that he was known to the young Italians who knew him as the maledetto polacco, the accursed Pole. <laughs> and he was involved in duels with members of Victoria, Victor Emmanuel's uh, uh, guard, etc., etc., etc. But the most important thing he did in Rome was he ran into Prince Rajivil, uh, who was uh, probably the leading lay Catholic in Poland, who was visiting Rome to report to the Pope on the state of Catholicism in Poland. And uh, he knew Krzyzewski because Krzyzewski's father, uh, the engineer, had enrolled Krzyzewski in this uh, lay group of Polish young Catholics, noblemen, to beef up their Catholicism, etc. Et sort of like the Opus Dei outfit today. And uh, so Rajivo ran into Krzyzewski in Rome and of course he knew it from Poland, so he asked him to give a talk to a bunch of, card about 50, cardinals, the general of the Jesuit order, who at that time who was a Spaniard named Martin. And uh, so Krzyzewski gave this talk to them called The Relations of the Polish Clergy to the Youth, 
as a youth to the clergy. Why, he made a big impact. Uh, it was kind of like a signal about what this guy was going to become. And this was the guy who was, meanwhile, when he wasn't talking to the cardinals, he was having duels with these Italian guards, <laughs> usually over women. So uh, that was the major thing that he did in, in Italy. Then he went back to Poland uh, in time for his father's death, which was 1904. And from that point on, he was kind of the in charge of the Piszczynski affairs, the estate, the dealing with the peasants, dealing with the Russians, Cossacks, etc., who were working on the estate to supplement their meager income from being soldiers in the Russian Empire. Can you discuss a little bit about uh, Poland's political environment at that time? Ah, okay. Well, this, uh, we're talking about 1879 uh, to 1915 when Krzyzewski came to North America. Well, also, we're talking about 1879 is, what, 14 years after the insurrection of 1863, which, which was a major insur insurrection, mainly initiated and led by the nobility, but uh, really for the first time, not the first time, because many peasants had been involved in Kosciuszko's insurrection of, of uh, 1794. But this was the, well, let's say the second time <laughs> that large numbers of peasants were involved, both in Poland and Lithuania, and this was primarily directed against the Russian occupation. Uh, which was a function of the Third Partition of 1795. Uh, so Kurzewski was born roughly 13, 14 years after that insurrection was suppressed. His father was among the, like uh, Joseph Conrad's uncle, Tadeusz Bobrowski, was among what sometimes called the conciliationists, those who were very patriotic, but who considered themselves realistic, who said, well, the best thing we can do for Poland is work, work along within this system to provide for the people at large. So that was Krzyzewski's father's view. And uh, Joseph Conrad's uncle's view too. Well, Krzyzewski grew up with that. His father was an engineer and he uh, uh, taught him a lot about mathematics and science when he was very young. And this is very important for how Krzyzewski developed. Krzyzewski eventually, well, uh, when he returned uh, to Poland in, in 1904, just in time for his father's death. <coughs> he did such things, well, actually before that, he had, for example, set up a school or the estate for the peasants because he felt that, that they should be educated. And he was very popular with his, his so-called peasants. And, uh, He, he set up the school, well, that was strictly against uh, Russian law, and he was uh, threatened with uh, being shipped off to Siberia. But his father had enough clout in the Russian government that he was able to get him off, and this was shortly before he died. So that was a narrow escape, because if that had happened, uh, we, we just, well, we wouldn't have this book today. Science of Sanity, second printing of the fifth edition. It says here, 
with preface by Robert P. Pua. And that's why we're here. <laughs> um, when did when did Korzybski begin to write and write down his thoughts about semantics? Just when did, when did semantics. He, general semantics? When did he begin to think that he could be a scholar, a writer, a creator? Not till he had been through World War One. He was wounded by artillery fire. He was lame to begin with, but he was also wounded in the hip, I believe, by artillery fire on the Eastern Front. Uh, so he, he, he knew what was going on in the world. And for the record, who was he fighting with? He was fighting with the Russian army against the Germans. And uh, as I have suggested elsewhere, <clears throat> I think that he saw this as part of the thousand-year competition between uh, Poles and Germans. In other words, he didn't volunteer to be in the Russian army because he was in love with the Russian system, but he was determined not to be taken over by the Germans. What rank did he have? Well, it's, it's an interesting thing. Since he was a member of the higher nobility, he really almost didn't have a rank. He was just a nobleman serving in the army. Technically, <coughs> when he first uh, enlisted, all of these nobles who were in the Russian army, uh, ex except those, of course, who became generals and so forth, were called privates. But it was known that they were a special class of privates because they were nobility. And indeed, he did very significant work, <coughs> primarily in intelligence. He would interrogate prisoners, for example since he knew many languages. Uh, and uh, so that he was, although he was technically called a private, he was actually functioning at, at, at least, I, I suppose, maybe at a colonel level, let's say. So, ask me another question. Okay. <laughs> so, let's say between 1904 and 1914, what was he doing? He was teaching at a gymnasium uh, in Warsaw and probably one in, uh, uh, I, I can't bring up the name right now, it starts with an M, but uh, somewhere away from Warsaw. Uh, he taught physics, chemistry, French and German. And, uh, and he was also running the estate. His mother was not at all <coughs> competent to do things like that. Did he have any siblings that yes, could help? Yes, he had a sister <coughs> named Adriana, uh, but with whom he didn't really have much contact. Uh, once she, she was uh, sent to Vienna to a Catholic school, uh, uh, School of the Sacred Heart, something like that. And uh, from that point on, she, she really lived away from the family and didn't have much contact with her. They corresponded a bit, but there wasn't much you know, contact there. And indeed, uh, in 1947, a uh, fellow named Ken Kais, who was interviewing Krzyzewski for a biography, asked him about his sister. He said, oh, he just knows so many people were killed there in World War II, and he just hadn't heard anything. So. Was Krzyzewski actively involved? But I, I know from my research in Warsaw that she did, in fact, 
uh, survived the war briefly and then died. Where did she die? Um, was it in Poland? I'm hearing in my head Milanov. Okay, so it was in which Poland. Is a northern suburb of, of, of Warsaw. Mm -hmm. Uh, was Korzybski involved with the uh, the revival of Polish culture in Poland at the turn of the uh, 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 was of he the involved previous in that? century? Yeah. Uh, no. What we what uh, they coined? I would say no in this sense. Uh, in that he was not producing anything. He didn't write anything until he came to North America, and specifically America. His first publication was just before Manhood of Humanity, was a paper that he published, I guess, in 1920 or, or early 21. Uh, but his first significant publication in his English, which he remarkably got having started studying English in 1916 in Canada with this guy named Gilchrist, who was a Canadian. Krzyzewski was teaching Gilchrist French, and Gilchrist was teaching Krzyzewski English. And this was at the uh, munitions camp in uh, Petawawa, Canada. What year? 19... Well, he... he went there initially, and he went there in January 1916. So it was, this process started uh, probably, let's say, in the spring of 1916, and by 1921 he wrote Manhood of Humanity. Now, as with, you... With help from a mathematician at Columbia named Cassius Kaiser, who wrote in a very sort of florid English style, and Krzyzewski's wife, who he married in 1919, used to refer to Cassius Kaiser's style as that church organ prose. <laughs> she much preferred Krzyzewski's original writing of Manhood of Humanity to what Kaiser helped Krzyzewski to do with it later on. Now, leading up to that, who would you say influenced Korzybski when he was in Poland before making the transition to the United States? <coughs> well, I think it's safe to say that uh, Korzybski was influenced by everybody. Now, here's the list of people to whom Krzyzewski de uh, dedicates his book. It goes from Aristotle to Ludwig Wittgenstein. It includes Einstein and a bunch of other people. Kant, what? Closer? Oh, oh. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a bunch. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as Poland is concerned, the names that come to mind immediately, aside from all of the figures of the Polish tradition, Fritz Modrzejewski, Kopernik, all these people, but in the modern uh, era, the 19th century, people like Bronisław Malinowski, the anthropologist, uh, Łukasiewicz, the, the mathematical logician, the inventor of multivalued logics, etc., uh, and a whole array of people. So, And he, he wrote several times, including in Science and Science, he said, what I say has been said by many, many times before. But his claim, which is 
I consider fully justified. It says, what I have done is gather this stuff, plus, of course, some of my original notions, into a system which can be taught. That's the achievement of Krzyzewski. Now, what did he do leading up to manhood of humanity that you would say would be a function of his thought processes leading up to manhood of humanity and ultimately resulting in science and sanity? Yeah. Well, it goes back to when he was an infant. He said on several occasions that when, when, when I was an infant, I didn't speak. I just looked around. And he, he claimed that he really didn't speak until he was about five years old. But he clearly remembers, at, at which point, he says, his father gave him the feel of the calculus at five years old. And this business of just, you know, not thinking that you have to blur out something about how you think things are, first you have to take a look around. And he often said in seminars when somebody would ask him a question, if he didn't know, he would say, I don't know, let's see. Let's take a look. So that orientation dates back to his infancy. And I consider that psychologically the most important engine which drove him to produce this kind of stuff. He apparently was born extensional, as we say. Extensional means oriented toward facts, observation, the nonverbal level. First, before you start telling people uh, how, how the world is going. Now, you said he came to the United States in about 1916, or was it well, Canada? 19, December 1915. 15. And that in January he came to New York, okay. and he was coming on a mission from the Russian army uh, to supervise the manufacture and shipment of ammunition, horseshoes and stuff like that, to Russia. So that's why he was sent here, he was on a, an official mission for the Russian government. Now, when did he make the transition from Poland to the United States? Well, he really didn't make it fully until after the publication of Science and Science. Throughout the 20s, he and his wife, I mean, there's lots of correspondence where he keeps talking to people that he's he and his wife are going to live in Poland. Up until the publication of Science and Sanity, he listed his addresses as New York and Warsaw. So it was not a sharp thing. Uh, a famous uh, German-American scientist, uh, what the hell is his name? Well, I don't have to say his name. I can't think of it right now. But anyway, he finally in about, oh, early on, uh, maybe in the mid-twenties, he knew that Krzyzewski was thinking about going back to Poland. And he uh, insisted that, no, you should stay here and complete your work. And here being? America. Columbia? New York? Where? Well, at that point, Krzyzewski might have been in La Jolla, California. He was all over the United States from the time that he came. Uh, 
especially after publishing uh, Manhood of Humanity, he lectured all over the place, visited institutions, had a close relation with some of the leading uh, scientists and psychiatrists, people like that, at Johns Hopkins uh, here in Baltimore. So uh, he was very, 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 very active, but he was so intended to go back because after all, he had the estate there, uh, his family there. So, uh, uh, who was running the estate? I mean, he was obviously here, but back then you didn't have telephones. Well, you didn't have, uh, who was that, handling? That's it? an interesting question. Uh, the main thing to run uh, at that port in the nineteen twenties was this huge apartment house in Warsaw that was owned by Krzyzewski's mother. He said that it had uh, 25 apartments of four to five rooms each. It was destroyed in World War II. And I went there and saw the replacement building in, in uh, I guess, 2001. I checked that out. <laughs> but uh, that, that was the main thing. Well, eventually, uh, uh, I mean, his mother had uh, a guy named Pawlowski, who was the manager that Kaczynski didn't trust one bit, and indeed, she eventually married him in 1931, and uh, much to Kaczynski's distress from here in America, because he there's a copious correspondence from. Krzyzewski and his mother throughout this period until uh, her death in 1937. And he was trying desperately to get her order, even keel, because he thought she was just being goofy and throwing her money away on this guy. And there was also a uh, a kind of a housekeeper type, but who was a young woman, younger than Pawlowski considerably, and much younger than Countess Kozitska. So what Kozitska was perceiving was Pawlowski, who was married to his mother, is having yummy dealings with this young woman, and meanwhile uh, consuming the Countess's money. So that was the situation. At one point, Krzyzewski and, and his wife, who was named Mara Edgerly, lent the Countess 5,000 American dollars, which would be probably something like 50,000 today. And she did not repay it before she died, and on one of her trips to Poland, Charlotte Reed, who, as we mentioned, was Krzyzewski's executive secretary and uh, editorial consultant, etc., when she was in Poland, she tried to retrieve that money through the Polish courts. But this was in, like, uh, 19... 70, roughly, and so of course that just wasn't doable. For one thing, so much paperwork was destroyed in the Warsaw Uprising, particularly. Uh, just about all of the Krzyzewski family records, except some stuff that Janusz Krajewski, a researcher, was able to find. So uh, that, that just wasn't doable. Um. <clears throat> so, at some point in time, Korzybski decided, this is it, I'm staying here in America, yeah, I'm going to do my work. He, he kept, there kept being not just difficulties, but creative opportunities, because he was being invited to lecture all over the place. And he was working very hard on his stuff. His wife was painting all over the at least the Western Hemisphere and Europe, where 
she knew Gertrude Stein in Paris, for example, things like that. So they had this desire to go, but meanwhile they were both so busy with their creative work that they just kept not going. And now, eventually, uh, well, he did go to the uh, International Conference of uh, Mathematicians of the Slavic countries in 1929, in September, in Warsaw. And there he met and talked with people that he'd been corresponding with, like Lukashevich and Kotarbinsky, Kvistek, all of these uh, philosophers, mathematical uh, logicians, etc., etc., the famous uh, the Warsaw School of the interwar period. Uh, but he just went there for that conference and then came back uh, to the U.S. And, and as I said, by the time of the publication of Science and Sanity, he, he had realized that, well, he was going to finish his life in America because that's where his work was. By that point, he was very well known and sought after, etc. Et so so his, his whole career was here. Um, have you discovered in any of his correspondence his thoughts about Poland's chances, let's say, between World War I and World War II, of really succeeding in this effort to revitalize the culture, secure its borders, and project its culture outwards. Yeah, yeah. He was he was very much a Polish patriot, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess it was in nineteen nineteen. I remember correctly. I have a a letter from Kaczynski to Piłsudski. Piłsudski, mm. a marshal of Poland, defeated the Russians. Uh, outside of Warsaw in 1920, et cetera, et cetera, and was the, sometimes called the George Washington of Poland. Well, this letter from Krzyzewski <coughs> to Pusutsky is basically offering himself, Krzyzewski's self, as a consultant to the Polish government uh, and, and almost like a job application. There are lots of things I can do, lots of things I know. I can be useful to you. I would like to help out. He also wrote uh, a thing before, it was the first thing actually he wrote, which he had to write before he could write Manhood of Humanity. And it was a, a thing, it's called A Polish Soldier Comments on the War. I, I'll have to give you a copy of that. And it's a very thoughtful, passionate statement about how people should think about war and how it is for those who are in the battles, the terror, the bloodshed, etc., etc., etc and how destructive it is of human consciousness. It's a very strong, very strong thing. Yet, uh, regardless of... So, uh, another thing I yeah. refer back to is educating the peasants on his estate, which was strictly against the law under the Russians. He was from childhood on very much focused on the need for education, for developing human beings, all human beings, so that they could make their lives better. So before leading up to Science and Santa, let's talk a little bit about his work here in the United States. First of all, how did he support himself? And second of all, talk a little bit about his wife, his family unit, so to speak, here in the United States, and where did he settle 
so eventually he could do his work and create such a magnificent work like Sites and Sandy. Well, he, he lived in many places, of course, New York, Brooklyn, for a time when he was uh, first started to work on Manhood of Humanity. He lived in a, 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 a so-called abandoned farm. It wasn't really abandoned. That's the guy who owned it still lived there, a fellow named Jesse Bennett. <coughs> and he invited Krzyzewski to come and stay there to do his work. And people from Johns Hopkins, like uh, Pearl, uh, uh, the guy, the I guy, uh, Wilmer of the Wilmer Clinic, people like that used to come down to this place in Arnold, Maryland for four-day weekends and they would all talk together and they would go there because Bennett uh, liked to have people come and do that kind of things and these people from Baltimore, from Johns Hopkins mainly, were very interested in what Kaczynski was up to so they would come and have these practically seminars you might say. So. And, and he lived all over the country. Sometimes he was in Chicago, uh, La Jolla, California, at the Scripps Institute. His wife was a very well-known painter, and she painted mainly uh, so-called upper-class people, princes and princesses and countesses and lords in England and South America, all of them. She was especially famous for uh, painting on these large paddles of ivory, which she especially imported from Africa. And she liked that because the paint on the ivory pattern, there's a kind of a luminescence that comes through the ivory that greatly beautifies and enlivens the painting. So, she was very popular. So he made, she very much provided the money as a function of her painting because she got paid very well. I mean, she was known all over the world, all, all over the Western Hemisphere and Europe, anyway. Uh, even people like uh, Gainsborough, I think it was, spoke very highly of her. So she was well loved. And she was the one who insisted on keeping the count business going because she found it very useful to be billed as Countess Kozipska who will come to your estate for three or four months, get to know you first, and then thank you. That's the way she operated. <laughs> she was <coughs> quite a place. She was responsible for the first publications of Gertrude Stein. Because it, when she was in Paris, she knew somebody in London who was the publisher, and she took Gertrude Stein to London to meet with this guy, Logan, I think his name was. And sure enough, that eventuated in Gertrude Stein's first publication. So they, they were they were in the top of the intellectual and social world. Now before we get of to, the world of the world, yeah. Now before we get to <clears throat> manhood of humanity and science and sanity, there was a major event occurring in the world at that time, which affected Poland greatly. The, the what? A major event in Poland that affected not only Poland but eventually the rest of the world, and that was the Bolshevik uh, attack on Poland, yeah. as you mentioned earlier, on, in 1920, right. when Stalin, and Stalin at that time was in the military, he faced Pilsudski, who you mentioned earlier. But that is a very key point, because Poland stopped at that point the Bolsheviks' movement west. Yes. In New York. Well, but let me ask for that. But let me ask you yeah. this though. Okay. The driving 
force behind the Bolshevik Revolution, as we know, was the thinking and writing and philosophy of Marx. To what extent was Korzybski aware of Marx and also the Lenin and the Bolshevik Re Revolution in, in Russia and the eventual attack on Poland and the ultimate defeat? Where was Korzybski in all of this? in his thinking, in his writings, and his outlook. Okay. Well, first of all, I say if you will read, well, you know, I know that you know, that Poland was one of the major places of origination for what we call socialism, but a democratic socialism. And that's I won't go into this, but I consider that ultimate and an oxymoron, because if the, if the government is going to be the employer of first and last resort, then we're not talking about uh, a free society. But that's another matter. If you read Manhunter of Humanity, which we'll talk more about later, you'll f realize, wow, this... This, a lot of this sounds socialistic because he's concerned about uh, the society's involvement in itself through government. Uh, and there's no question about that. At the same time, he has a very keen understanding of capital, much more so than, than Marx. And he knew Marx quite well. He also knew a lot of great Polish socialist writers who influenced Lenin, by the way, who lived in Kraków for a couple of years before he went into Russia to make the revolution. You know, Lenin was a Russian nobleman. He wasn't, he wasn't no proletarian. In fact, it's interesting. If you look at the history of socialism from Marxism, most of the originators and leaders, at the beginning at least, were from the nobility. Well, anyway, Krzyzewski was quite aware of all this stuff. You know, he was in America and Canada as an agent of Russia. But when the first revolution in 1917 occurred and the Tsarist regime collapsed, Krzyzewski then got involved with recruiting for the Polish-French military commission in the United States, which was recruiting troops to fight in Europe on the side of the Allies from 1917 to 1918. So, and Krzyzewski did a whole lot of work. He also lectured mostly in the uh, in the north, well, in the mid-Atlantic region, I guess, but also further north and as, and, and as far as west as West Virginia and Ohio. Uh, selling liberty bonds. He was a lecturer for the U.S. government. <laughs> and he had got very good responses. He was mostly lecturing to workers. When he got into the recruiting business, there was a population of about one million Poles in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, uh, Ohio, general area, and he was involved in recruiting there. He had problems with that. He, he considered that Podolewski was selling Polish blood, so he wanted the Polish army to be independent, like the uh, Pershing's army. You know, initially, Pershing was being, uh, with the American Expeditionary Force, the, the English wanted them to be under British control. 
And Pershing said, no way, Jose. We will be an independent operation working in cooperation with the French and the English. And Krzyzewski had the same view about the Polish army that he was recruited for. But he couldn't pull that off, so it was eventually the Poles from America who went to France, served under French command initially, but then eventually Polish officers were placed in charge of the Polish units, who were still, however, part of the French army, and providing replacements for Frenchmen and so forth. So he was very much uh, aware of developments all around the world, philosophically, politically, economically. He was the first one who taught me in Manitoba of Humanity that capital must flow. That, that was a big understanding for me about 40 years ago, that if capital isn't moving, it's worthless. That's why you shouldn't put it under your mattress. 